Appreciate that message and song and, and all these today that have been helpful to us to remember our Lord and uh, even in preparation in uh, honoring him this week in particular. So thank you. And, and Jesus even said that, that that account of the woman uh, breaking that alabaster box would be told of her as a memorial to her, uh, wherever this gospel is being preached. So we're continuing to pass that on. So good job, Brother Kevin and Brother Kevin. Appreciate that very much. Okay, let me ask you to go to two different passages of Scripture, uh, Exodus 12. We'll start there, Exodus chapter 12, and then mark your Bible in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So let's stand in honor of God's Word here tonight. So Exodus 12, and then 1 Corinthians 11. We'll do an illustration here tonight. It's not going to be that long of a message where I've got to have that much water. That's not, that's not what this is, <clears throat> Okay. Ted was all concerned. He thought, good night. We're you ever getting out of here. So, All right. Exodus 12. <clears throat> so Exodus 12 and 1 Corinthians 11. Exodus 12 and verse number 14 is where we're going to start. I'm uh, putting this in our series, Teach Them. So we're departing, obviously, from our Second Samuel uh, series, although we just got started back into it. We're taking just a brief break uh, here once again. Obviously, in preparation for Tuesday night, I'll say more about Tuesday night, um, just to try to help us all to be uh, well prepared uh, for that observance. And then, of course, looking forward to the Resurrection Sunday and celebrating the fact of His resurrection. And so um, I'm calling tonight the message... That, uh, the message tonight, I'm calling it this, Lessons from the Lord's Supper. Okay, so we're going to look at that. And so I want you to try to tune in here tonight as we look at Exodus 12, the background. I'm just going to read a few select verses. But really try to tune in here from the very beginning so that you can get the connection to the teach them aspect of this. Okay, would you do that? And that'll shave off like 20 minutes of the message if you do. So it'll help immensely. All right, so... Now, verse number 14, um, it's talking about the Lord's Passover. If you just glance, verse 11, this is the Lord's, it is the Lord's Passover. And, and, um, and the blood would be uh, applied to the doors. And, and thus, verse 13, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. There's the terminology, the Passover. Now, verse 14, now, and this day shall be unto you for a what? memorial. This day shall be unto you for a memorial, and you shall keep it a feast to the Lord, watch this, throughout your generations. Everybody see that? So keep this as a memorial throughout your generations, perpetually, throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by, and what? What's the next word? An ordinance forever, okay? Now, verse, uh, verse number 17, same chapter, and you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. So you have the, the Passover meal and the unleavened bread. For in the selfsame day have I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. <clears throat> Therefore shall ye observe this day in your what? Generations. There it is again. By an ordinance. There it is again. Forever. In fact, there's a lot of repetition in, these, in this chapter and the next intentional repetition, all right? Now, uh, verse number 24 of the same chapter, Exodus 12, 24. And you shall observe this thing for an ordinance to thee and to thy who? Sons forever. So you observe this, your sons, pass it down, your sons observe this, all right? Verse 25, and it shall come to pass when you be come to the land which the Lord will give you according as he hath promised that you shall keep this service. It shall come to pass and it shall come to pass, verse 26, when your children shall say unto you, what mean ye by this service? Everybody see that? Why are we doing this? That's a good question for the new generation to ask. Now, why do we do this? What mean ye by these stones? They would say in Joshua, the stones stacked up. What mean ye by, what, what does this mean? What mean ye by this service? Um, somebody 
new to Southwest, what mean ye by this service on a Tuesday night? What mean ye by this service? A new believer might ask, what, what, is, what is the Lord's Supper? What are we having, right? I mean, that, we hear supper and we think all kinds of things. What, what mean ye by, I'm, I'm just simply saying, I'm not trying to be irreverent, I'm just saying, what mean ye by this service? So one generation would ask the previous generation, what's this all about? And then that generation was to do what? Teach them. Okay, teach them. All right, where are we at? Verse 27. That ye shall say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover who pass over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses and the people bowed the head and worshiped. So there's a reverence about all this, isn't there? Verse 28, and the children of Israel went away and did as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, I like this, so did they. So That's so important. So did they. All right, now, I haven't forgotten that you're still standing, but let's go over to chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians, okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1. You can hold your place in Exodus. We may or may not do a whole lot of work back there, but 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, be ye what? Followers. So someone's going before you. Be ye followers, Paul says, of me, even as I am of Christ. Okay, so follow me as I follow Christ. Verse 2, now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things and keep the, what? Ordinances as I delivered them to you. So you keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. And then he has a whole big discussion about headship. The head of Christ the fa is the father. The head of the man is Christ. The head of the woman is the man. And so he's got all that going on. Then he has a whole big illustration about hair. You say, well, that's not something you know a whole lot about, right? Well, that's true. Short hair on men, long hair on women. It's right here in the Bible. But it's all saying everybody has headship that you ought to follow. Okay, so we don't have time to get into that. I'm just referencing it as part of the reading. All right, now, verse number uh, 23. For I have received, everybody see that in verse 23? Paul says, for I have received of the Lord that which, uh, which also I delivered unto you. Would you say without any altercation, or alteration rather? <laughs> Wrong word. He didn't alter it. Okay. They were having altercations in the church of Corinth. Okay. But here it is. He says, what I've received of the Lord, that's what I delivered to you. And then he specifies, verse 23, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread and when he had given thanks, he break it and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in what? Remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do what? Show, could, could we say it this way? You do teach. You do show. That's the idea of teaching, isn't it? You do show, you demonstrate, you do show the Lord's death. I like this. Till he come. Which indicates, although we're remembering his death, he's still alive and he's coming again. All right? Lessons from the Lord's Supper. May God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated. Thank you for your kind attention. I really tried to labor at pointing some of those things out even ahead of time. Okay, so I think you're already seeing it, but every generation is responsible to pass on to the next generation what we've received from the Lord. That's really how this is supposed to work. Every generation passes on to the next generation the truths of God's word. And honestly, we could spend a whole night service on just that truth. Because look what happens when a nation begins to fail 
I mean, you just think about from the book of Joshua to the book of Judges, what happened when one generation either did not teach or the next generation refused to listen or altered it to suit themselves. Everybody get that? That's very important. Okay, so what we receive from the Lord, we're to pass on to the next generation so that truth continues. Now, truth doesn't change. There's, there's, no, there, there's no alteration of truth. I mean, uh, uh, God's truth, well, here, it may not be settled in the courthouses across the land. It may not be settled in the White House. It may not be settled in the college university. But forever, O oh Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. So God's word doesn't change. We don't have to worry about that. But I think you all would agree, and, and it's part of our theme this year, that what we have received from the Lord, I feel a great sense of responsibility that we should pass it on intact to the next generation. And that's why we have a two-year-old class where they are asking questions, where do the accounts that we talk about, where do the stories come from? They come from the Bible. Who gave us the Bible? God did. Is his word true? Yes! I would imagine that's how they say it, with a little bit of enthusiasm. Well, they're learning from a very early age that there is truth. Hey, you know what? That's a concept, that's a truth that a two-year-old can grasp hold of. That truth is not relative to whoever. It's not like my truth and your truth. No, that, that's, that's postmodernism. That's, that's modern thinking. That's, that's relativism. That's, that's not right. Because there is absolute truth. If somebody says there's not absolute truth, they're making a statement as though it were. <laughs> and, and they're going down. It's the, it's the roadrunner effect. You know, you know every, remember the roadrunner as he'd get out on the chasing, uh, well, I'm sorry, the coyote? Is that how it is? Come on, it's been a long time since Saturday morning. He's chasing the roadrunner. He gets out over the air and then he realizes, holds up the sign and down he goes, right? That's, that's how those arguments run that say, there's no thing, such thing as absolute truth. Because there is. There is absolute truth. So one generation is responsible to pass down the truth to the next generation. That's really a lot of what we're reading. And I do want to do our due diligence. I've, I've got a, a couple goals here tonight. One would be I want to try to teach with clarity the background to what we know now as the Lord's Supper. Okay, let me ask this. How many of you, this will be your first time observing the Lord's Supper? Just raise your hand not to embarrass you. I realize, okay, there's some, Brother Nate just got saved this year. Uh, who else? Raise your hand real high so I can see it. There may be a few others right over here. Here. Yeah, look, okay, a lot of young people, a lot of children that are, hey, thank God for that. Isn't that awesome? First time observing the Lord's Supper, been saved and baptized. Whether a child or an adult, that is fantastic. Okay, so the background, I want to do due diligence to talk about uh, the background to the Lord's Supper, which is the Passover. That's why we went back to the book of Exodus, chapter number 12, the Passover. And that's what Jesus observed with his disciples. But here's what he did. He took the Passover and gave it heightened significance. Now, there's a connection between the two that we will be looking at. The second goal is quite simply this, just to make sure that we as a church family are spiritually prepared. And that's a lot of what, I'm not going to spend as much time in 1 Corinthians 11, maybe as we typically would, but, but this, this chapter is about a church that was not observing the Lord's Supper with a proper attitude and a lot of the selfishness, that, which is the same way it is at home. You know, if there's, if there's selfishness being manifested at the table, right? If there's a lot of fighting at the table between siblings, probably that didn't start just at the table. There probably was some skirmishes going on outside or in, in the living room or, or in the bedroom. They're fighting there and they come in here and they're fighting here. Well, that's, that's what's happening at the Lord's table is that there was all this strife and contention in the church in Corinth and, and uh, the rich were, were, uh, were really taking advantage of the situation. The poor were neglected. Um, sin was not being dealt with like sin ought to be dealt with. And, and thus they were not properly observing the Lord's Supper. And so Paul said, because of this, some sleep, some are weak, some are sick, and some sleep. In other words, some have passed away. So this is very important as a church family that we come into the observance of the Lord's Supper with, with great respect and reverence and, and really even with 
a purging. And all of that fits within the Lord's Supper. So if I can explain this, it all will, will come together. And I, I guess I should also say that I actually have a third goal. I told you two, but here's one more. That we would be faithful to pass on to the next generation of Southwest Baptist Church what we have received. Because otherwise this thing gets diluted. It gets watered down. Okay, so... Briefly, the background of the Passover. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then during the time of Jacob, you had Joseph and his brothers that hated him. And so they sold him to these that were traveling down to Egypt. He becomes a uh, servant of Potiphar. His wife falsely accuses him. He ends up in jail. But God uses all that to save Israel. How's that for fast Bible history? Okay. All right. But God uses Joseph and, uh, and so Israel is spared there in the land of Egypt. They grow. Father Abraham had many sons, and many sons had Father Abraham. And so they just kept multiplying. And so Pharaoh felt threatened. And that generation that did not know, they didn't know Joseph, they felt threatened. And so they began to kill the baby boys, and, except for what the Hebrew midwives were able to spare. And one of those little Hebrew boys that they spared was a boy named, eventually, Moses. And Moses would grow up in Egypt and he would be, ironically, the, the son of Pharaoh's daughter and the very one who was trying to wipe them out. <laughs> God providentially worked through his life to deliver them all. Love it. What, a, what an account. Well, uh, as Moses goes back into Egypt, then God tells him to go tell Pharaoh, let my people go. And uh, Pharaoh, being stubborn and obstinate as he was, refused to let them go. And thus you have the ten plagues. The lice, the, the, I'm sorry, the river turned to blood and the frogs and the lice and the flies. And I mean, really everything they worship, God said, God turned it into that, a plague. But the last plague, the last thing that happened, the last judgment upon Israel, I'm sorry, upon Egypt was the most severe because uh, Pharaoh was deemed to be a God and his firstborn was deemed to be a God and would be the one that would succeed him. And so the firstborn in the land of Egypt was worshiped essentially and was very important to all the Egyptians. And so God said, I'm going to take the life of all the firstborn. So Moses, here's what you're to do. Okay. Is everybody following along so far? You're to take you take a, a, a lamb and on, the, on this day in the month of Nisan, then you are to, to kill that lamb and take the blood of that lamb and to put it over the doorpost. And when I see the blood, when I did that, I actually just looked up at the cross here. When, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. That is the Passover. They were to search their house for leaven. Leaven was to be gotten out of the house to this very day. The Jews will do that this week. They are removing leaven from their house. Leaven, they couldn't have leaven. It, they didn't have time for the bread to rise. It was, they were going to eat in haste and then get on the road very quickly to get out of Egypt. And thus it was unleavened bread. And so that's why they observed that. But also leaven is a picture of sin. And that, that gives us a little bit of a connecting point right here to say, that's why right now, even as current day believers, we need to make sure that sin and wrong is out of our life so that we can properly observe the Lord's Passover, the Lord Jesus Christ, the sacrifice for our sins and, and for your sins. They would observe this. God gave them very detailed, uh, a detailed account on how that they were year after year at this time of the year, once a year in a very special way. Remember the blood shed that sets you free. Well, that just sounds like it'll preach, doesn't it? Remember the blood shed that sets you free. And God, God had the, the children of Israel to do that year after year. They would eat bitter herbs and to remember their bitter time in, in the land of Egypt. And they would eat of the Passover lamb to remember the blood that was shed. And so they would pass this down generation after generation after generation to look back and to be thankful to God for his deliverance of their people Israel that he delivered them by the blood that was shed. That's the Passover. Jesus in Matthew, we'll read in, on Tuesday night, Matthew chapter 26 and 27 about the crucifixion, but we'll also read about the Passover that he observed with his disciples. They asked him where they, that he would, that they would prepare 
the Passover meal. And they found this large upper room and they gathered there and they're all around uh, the table and, and he's taken the Passover and as the head of the family, because I need to mention this as well, the head of the family would explain to the family year after year what the Passover would mean. In fact, even to this day, little Jewish boys or girls will ask their dad, what means, what does this mean? Why do we drink the cup? Why do we, what is this cup about? What is this unleavened bread about? Why do we do this? Why do we do that? And the head of the family would explain that. Okay, so this is the context that Jesus is doing with his disciples. He's taking the bread and he's breaking the bread and he's giving it to them and he's saying, take, eat, this is my body. Okay, now there's more to it than what I'm gonna really go into, but because there's stages and phases of this, there was four cups that they would observe. When we come to Matthew 26, most likely what we're looking at is the third cup, the cup of redemption. And, and so that would be about the blood that was shed to, to deliver them from Egypt. Jesus takes that meaning about deliverance and he heightens it to mean this. I'm gonna shed my blood. My body's gonna be broken for you. My blood is gonna be shed for you that you might go free. And so God wants us to remember, and Paul says, I'm delivering to you that which was delivered to me, and I'm passing it on to you that you would pass it on to the next generation, that we would remember the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that was broken and was shed for us in our redemption that we might go free. This do in remembrance of me. One generation is to pass it on to the next generation. Okay, so with that understanding, let me, let me um, illustrate this here tonight, okay? Because here's what we, what we want to happen, all right? So this is um, it's what we observe with Welch's, 100% grape juice, all right? The fruit of the vine, okay? So let me get set up here just a little bit, Okay. This is going to be the story of basically two churches. All right? The story of two churches. Here's what's supposed to happen. One generation is to take what they've received from the Lord and to pass it on in its entirety to the next generation. We doing all right? Does that make sense? Then as that generation is passing off the scene, then they're to take it and pass it on to the very next generation. Same thing. Same meaning. Um, same elements. Same elements. Or not to take it and get creative and <laughs> use potato chips. I'm mentioning that because things like that happen today. That's blasphemous. Same meaning. Same elements. Same authority. It's a local church ordinance. It's, um, it's, not, a, um, it's not an individual ordinance. You can't observe this in your, just your family. You shouldn't observe this just when you're on a Holy Land tour. In the Garden of Gethsemane. It's a local church ordinance. It can't be otherwise. And so then that generation is to pass it on in its entirety to the next generation so that from the beginning Although this generation is no longer on the scene. Do you, are, you, are you with me? This generation physically is no longer on the scene. They're in heaven. Right? But what they started with has been passed down from this generation to this generation to this generation to this generation. From this church. In fact, if we, if we expounded on the illustration, then the, what this church started, it started in this church, and then that church maybe started in that church, and this thing just gets multiplied. Okay, but the point being, and I can use this cup currently now, these are the same exact things. Can I, can I remind you tonight that what we're about to observe 
on this Tuesday night at 7 o'clock for our church family because we've got to use the same meaning, the same authority, the same elements, and the same recipients. It's a local church ordinance. It's a family, and thus we practice what's known as a closed communion. Closed, meaning it's just for our church family, those that have been saved and baptized and members of this church because that's what Jesus did. So what I'm saying to you tonight is what we get to be a part of has been passed down for many generations so that what we have is a pure observance of the Lord's Supper. That should be our goal. Which there's some application even right here because where the children, I'm sorry, the, uh, the people in Corinth were getting off is that they were observing it with anger still in their heart and wickedness still in their lives. Okay, so that wasn't a pure observance. Is that right? Of the Lord's Supper. Okay, so with that in mind, let me show you what happens. This is the tale of two churches. That next church generation says, you know, I don't really want to use everything that was used there. We'll use some of it. Yeah, I mean, we'll still have it to represent the body and the blood of the Lord. Um, but I don't think authority is really that important. So we'll just have our own traditions and our own ideas about it. And they begin to water it down. In fact, here's what we believe. We believe that this becomes the literal body and blood of the Lord. That's called transubstantiation. Let me, let me read, it, read about this here just a moment. I'm reading Rick, uh, Brother Rich Farinella's book on the Lord's Supper. Very, very helpful. And you know, sometimes we hear these things about transubstantiation, but, but listen, this is from a Catholic publication entitled, uh, Beginning Apologetics 3, How to Explain, Defend the Real Presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Okay? What does the church, the Roman Catholic Church, teach about the Eucharist? Or, um, anyways, not the same as what we observe. I'm trying to be careful here. But listen to what they said. For nearly 2,000 years, the Catholic Church has taught that Jesus Christ is really and truly present in the blood of the, the, the juice and the wafer. Under the appearance of bread and wine, Christ is completely present in his body and blood as well as his soul and divinity. The moment the priest says the words of consecration, this is my body and this is my blood, here's what this publication says, God miraculously changes the ordinary bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. This transformation is called transubstantiation. The substance of the bread and wine are changed into the substance of Christ's living body and blood. The bread and wine are gone, replaced by the real presence of Christ, while only their appearances remain. Christ's presence in the Eucharist begins at the moment of concentration, consecration and lasts as long as appearances of bread, bread and wine remain. Um, when we receive Holy Communion, Jesus remains in our bodies for about 15 minutes. We should adore him within as long as he is sacramentally present with us. Wow. You know what that is? That's different than what, they, what it started with. I'm not trying to be unkind. I hope that's not coming across here. But that's, that's not what Jesus said. Listen to this now, okay? This is a, an apologetic of the Catholics, and they say this, we can't be indifferent about Christ's presence in the Eucharist. This issue separates Catholics from virtually all Protestants. That's a true statement. And I would add to it. They said this issue separates Catholics from virtually all Protestants, and I would add, and Baptists. Because Baptists aren't Protestants. Okay? If Christ is only symbolically present in the Eucharist, then Catholics are guilty of idolatry, worshiping mere bread and wine. 
But if Christ is really present in the Eucharist, then most non-Catholics are guilty of not recognizing or worse, denying or rejecting their Lord and Savior in the Eucharist. Then they say this, both sides cannot be right. Yes, that's true. Both sides can't be right. Why? Because there's absolute truth. So they're acknowledging this. This, is, this part is really good. I wish that I had written this. Both sides cannot be right. Whichever side is wrong on such a fundamental issue cannot claim to have preserved the whole gospel. It, listen to this. It cannot claim to be Christ's true church. I've never said amen to a Catholic, but that's right on. It cannot claim. Then they go on to say this. In true charity, neither side can let the other remain in error. Neither side can let the other remain in error. True ecumenicism means charitably resolving those kinds of doctrinal disagreements, not agreeing to disagree. In other words, they're saying this. Since both can't be true, whichever side is right needs to not let the other remain in error. So, we're preaching that Jesus is not physically present in this, but this reminds us of him. This is a memorial. How about that? Wow. So it gets watered down. It gets watered down by a different meaning, a different Idea. So then here's what happens, though. The next generation then comes along and it takes some of those ideas and applies it. But then they water it down even further. You know, it doesn't really matter if you're together as a church family. It doesn't matter who's administrating it. None of those things really matter. It doesn't really matter what it means. It doesn't even matter what you actually use. It's getting watered down. And then what happens is it comes to another generation and they say these things don't matter at all. And so it's just filled with more tradition, more man's ideas, and more compromise. So that what you have is basically two very different things. Church, we're called to observe according to what Jesus gave us and that he gave to Paul and Paul gave to the churches and those churches started churches and it just got passed down until what we have is a pure observance. By the way, not because we're better than anybody else. That's not it at all. But here's the key. We've got to go by what the word says. The church in Corinth was watered down because of immorality, because of strife, let me ask you this. Is this a good picture of the Lord's blood? It's not at all, is it? It's not a good picture because of the strife. I mean, you, you, here, here they came to, to Corinth Baptist Church, and one side is fighting against the other side, and this person's suing that person. I mean, that was going on. They were suing one another. And they were fighting about which one of them had the best spiritual gifts. And there, there was confusion with the speaking in tongues and, and nobody there to interpret. And then, then a man was with his in-law. I mean, this was just wickedness and some fornication that was going on. And they weren't dealing with it. They were just sweeping it under the rug. That is not a clear picture of what Jesus did. He came to save us from that. And they're indulging in it. It's been watered down. What we need to do is say, Lord, we're sinners and we need your cleansing and we want to represent you with great clarity. And would you see, search my heart tonight, dear God, and would you see if I've got aught against anybody? Lord, if I'm harboring any kind of bitterness, Lord, would you make sure that that's out of my heart and life? God, would you seek, search my heart tonight and make sure I'm not secretly hiding some kind of, uh, of immorality or fornication because I don't, I don't want to misrepresent you to the world. The world does not need a watered-down version of Christianity. The world needs a, a true representation of what it means to be a, a Christian 
Christian and a believer. And, and so it's, it's up to you and I. Listen, friend, what we pass down depends on what we have. I don't want to pass this down to the next generation. I want to pass down to the next generation a true, biblical, authentic New Testament church that is pure and holy and righteous with the Lord, separated personally from the world and separated from those that have diluted His blood and, and have, have, have misrepresented grace and, and all those things. I don't want to pass down to the next generation some church that's not truly His church. Because what happens with the Lord's Supper can also happen when it comes even to other things. Such as what? Well, such as preaching. What used to be preaching the Bible has been watered down to the point where it's anemic and weak and just convoluted. No, we need preaching that would be straight from the Word of God that would represent Jesus as He is and represent us as we are. We don't need an entertainment mentality that just says, hey, preacher, just kind of tell us a few things and tell a few jokes if you got some new ones and just give us a little entertainment here tonight and let us go on our way. No, you need to be confronted with the Word of God that you and I are wickedly sinful and that we are selfish and proud and we want our way rather than God's way. And if you get full of yourself, what will you pass on to the next generation, beloved? What will you pass on? What will you pass on to your kids in terms of morality and separation from the world and loving God and serving God? What will you pass on? Think about that just a moment tonight. Think about that. You you don't need some preacher that's hip and telling you, yeah, you're cool because I'm cool and we're cool in this church. No, what you need is somebody that says, listen, we need the grace of God to do right. And we need to get the immorality out and the strife out and the wickedness out. We need to get right with God so that we can be a good reflection of Him, not a watered-down version of it. God deliver us from the weak, anemic, entertainment-based Christianity that is so prevalent here today. Because music gets watered down. So, literally, wow. Literally, songs about the blood have been removed. What do we have without the blood? Sin. It's not washed away. No, we need those songs about the blood. And I'm not, I'm not just trying to push amen buttons here tonight. That's not my intent at all. My intent is to help us understand that what has been passed down to us, we need to pass on to the next generation, which means it's your generation coming up. These things need to matter to you just like they matter to your parents. Because it's not enough that your parents had these convictions and that they had a pure life and a life that was pleasing to God. No, listen, friend, you need to have a life that's pleasing to God. Because I thank God for the generation, maybe even two and three and four back of Southwest Baptist Church, a perfect generation. No, there was people that were sinners there too. I'm not saying that at all. I think you understand what I'm saying. But by and large, this church has been known for wanting to be a church that is centered on the Word of God, that's not just hearing the Word of God, but doing the Word of God and trying to live a moral and pure life that is pleasing to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's not edgy and edgier, trying to get more and more like the world. Because listen, the more we get the watered down version of Christianity into our lives, the less and less we're like the church that he wants us to be. What will the next generation have to observe? If we water down this Bible and say, I don't think all that's in the Bible. And you start taking Acts 8 part of it out and Mark 16 out and John 8 out. Well, we'll just leave that back here and not pass it on to the next generation. Like they don't need to know about the woman taken in adultery that Jesus forgave. No, oh, listen, friend, that was it. That's in God's word and it's preserved in his word. So we don't need to pass on to the next generation a diluted form of truth. We need to pass on the full truth. This is not a buffet that you just went through like on Sunday afternoon where you get to pick and choose what you're going to pass on, what you're not going to pass on. Well, I don't know just how big of a deal that the local church doctrine is. I mean, I, you know, I, I think that it's probably broader than that and that all, all saved people are part of the church. You didn't find that in the New Testament. 
Now, I understand that somebody could be saved and in the family of God and not in a, Bible, in, a, in a true church. But listen, that's not the same thing. And we can't water this down and say, well, it's just everybody's part of his church. And thus we can accept non-Baptist baptism that has been performed by somebody that believes you can lose your salvation. Do you see how that gets watered down in a hurry? Well, yeah, so, I mean, but they're, they're good people. It doesn't matter about what their morality, what's the doctrine? These things really do matter. That it gets passed on to the next generation because otherwise baptism is less than what baptism ought to be. I mean, in fact, it got to the point where some just sprinkle. Ba Isn't that ironic that, water, that baptism has been watered down? Actually, maybe we'd say it needs to be filled back up. And, and that it's got to be picturing the death, burial, and resurrection. And you don't do that by sprinkling dirt on somebody or pouring. No, it's got to be by immersion. Proper person that it's got to be somebody that's saved, not a baby that doesn't understand the gospel. I know, I know that we know these things, but listen, these things get watered down if we don't emphasize these things. You see, God was telling Israel, I want you to do this every year. I want you to re be reminded about the Passover every year. And here's how I want you to observe it. And, I, and Jesus said, I want you to observe the Lord's Supper every year. And here's how I want you to observe it. Because he wanted it to be pure when it came to our day and time. And so we've got to pass it on the same way. Well, that same idea applies to baptism and a, to the local church and to preaching and to music and to holy living in every area of life. Because in all things, everything's been watered down nowadays. Marriage? Family? What is a marriage? Well, as long as two people love each other. Genesis 19 kind of stuff? Genesis 2. We didn't get here all at one time. It's just one generation let it slide and then the next generation let it slide further. I think we need to be passionate about these things. Well, I mean, it's not that big of a deal. That's how you get here. If it's in the word, friend, it's a big deal. And Paul wrote to the church and said, what I've received of the Lord, that's what I've given you. And so what you've received, it needs to be passed on. Now, I'm looking around and I'm seeing a generation of Southwest Baptist Church a lot of them that have said amen here tonight understand the importance of this right here. What about the younger generation? You know, um, this needs to be resonating in your heart too to say, man, that's right, amen, that's what I want. And I'm not trying to get you to say amen, although that wouldn't hurt. Because you could be 15 and say amen out loud. Amen? Amen. Because you're needed to take up the mantle here. I remember when I was 15 and I said amen out loud. Shocked myself. <laughs> Anybody hear me there? <laughs> I, I say it one time and then you can say it again out loud. But what it's saying is that, man, these things are right. I don't want a watered down version of anything. I mean, who, who in the right mind would want a watered down version of anything? If we're talking sweet tea, you want watered down? No, 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 no. Watered down coffee? No, no, no. Weak, weak. Oh, come on now. That, is that, that's got to be in the Bible somewhere. You sh thou shalt not drink weak coffee. No, it needs to be strong. Right? You don't want weak coffee. You don't want weak sweet tea. You don't want weak watered down Coke. You don't want weak whatever else it is. No, you don't want, you don't want that. No, you want, you want it to be pure. Hey, yeah. same thing with the truths of the word of God applied in your life. Right, 
I don't want something watered down. I want that which has been given to me. I tell people quite often, I'm really just trying to pass on what I received. My father-in-law sent us a clip today, a video I think that my mother-in-law took. She sent in a guess, but uh, Brother Henry Myers, age 90, that stood up there and behind the pulpit and sang a special like he did when I was, well, <laughs> four, five, <laughs> that I can remember. Back when I wasn't paying any attention at all. But he was up there singing. Well, today, a couple of young men had to help him up and then had to help him down. But he stood there and he sang. What will your generation do with these great Bible truths? Where do we get these stories? From the Bible. Is the Bible God's word? Yes. Is it true? Yes. Then let's live it and not water it down. Let's stand together here tonight. Thank you for your kind attention. <clears throat> I realize tonight that's a different kind of message than maybe what we've ever had for the preparation of the Lord's Supper. But I hope you can see how that it's in line with our theme, teach them. And it certainly is in line with the observance of what God prescribed for the Passover for the Jews and what Jesus prescribed for his churches regarding the observance of the ordinances. I'm reminded that our dear pastor emeritus, Brother Sam, would often say, God only gave us two ordinances. We need to do them right. We need to do them right. So I trust that you know tonight what to do to search your heart. Let God search you and see if there's anything that would, that would prohibit a proper and right and reverent observance of the Lord's Supper here on Tuesday night. Father, I thank you for what we've received. As I read your word, we can trace it back to how it was when Jesus started the churches. Started the church there in Jerusalem and that church started the church in Antioch and so forth. God, I thank you that we can do that, that you've given us a guide in this world. And so, God, I pray that you'd help us to pass on to the next generation what we've received. Search us tonight. Help us, Lord, as we remember the death, the broken body, the body and the blood of our Lord and Savior. Search our hearts. Cleanse us, O oh God. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.